This is a video lecture on the fall of the Russian Revolution. By the fall, I mean the transition from the optimistic, uh, in, in some ways hopeful, beginnings in 1917 of the Russian Revolution to the horrors, the tyranny, the totalitarian state of the Soviet Union under Stalin. The purpose of this lecture is, is really twofold. One, I want to tell the story. I, I want to spend a little time on explaining just how we get from Lenin to Stalin. The, 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 the textbooks are usually sort of uh, slide over this part. Um, you know, Lenin gets sick, Stalin outmaneuvers Trotsky, Stalin takes over, Stalin is a monster. That's pretty much what, what you come in with, probably. I want to spend some more time. I want you to understand what happened to Lenin, what Stalin did, what mistakes Trotsky made, how we get from point A to point B. The second part of, of this lecture is to examine the really great historiographical question of the Russian Revolution, which is, was the end inevitable? Did the Bolshevik Revolution under Lenin inevitably lead to Stalin and the totalitarian horrors of the Soviet Union? We can all agree that Stalinist Russia was a disaster, a horror, and, and uh, one of the really great evils in European history. But was that, or something like that, inevitable given the Bolshevik triumph in 1917? Does Leninism lead to Stalinism? I'm going to present the argument that it did not. I think that's an important argument for you to be exposed to because as Americans, we're sort of trained to think of Soviet communism as monolithic, as universally uh, evil, as being um, unvaried, and that you know, it's all basically the same thing, right? I mean, Leninism, Stalinism, Communism, Russia, Soviet Union, it's all basically just bad. And that's a, that's a simplistic view of it. Um, and I want you to understand the arguments that someone who is sympathetic to Russia, who is sympathetic to the Bolshevik cause, to the ideals, would present to say that Stalin was a contingent event, not an inevitable one. Your job is to decide for yourself to what extent you think the Bolsheviks were going to create Stalinism no matter what. Okay, so with that, with that overview, uh, let's, let's sort of set the timeline. This is the, the essential background events which, which uh, set us up for... Uh, our, our story today. Uh, 1905, we're all uh, familiar with. This was the, the first Russian Revolution with the famous Bloody Sunday Massacre. Uh, this was the, the revolution, you recall, that comes out of the Russian defeat uh, in the Russo-Japanese War. Um, the Tsar briefly loses control to a wave of, of spontaneous public outcry and, and protest. He concedes the creation of uh, the Soviet parliament, the Duma, but then once the Tsar regains his balance, he's able to assert control and he neuters the Duma and returns to uh, the, the sort of traditional conservative absolute state that Russia is used to. So in one sense, 1905 is a failure for the revolutionaries, but it is also seen as the necessary precursor to the successful revolution of 1917. 1914, of course, is the beginning of the First World War, and you know the First World War is pivotal in so many ways, and this not least of all, uh, without the First World War, you don't have the Russian Revolution. You certainly don't have the Russian Revolution as we experience it. 
who knows what happens to Russia outside of it, but it's, it's clearly the stress and strain of the First World War that leads to the 1917 revolutions, first the February Revolution, which, again, which in many ways is similar to 1905. This is the spontaneous revolu uh, protest of people all over Russia, soldiers who are sick of the war, or peasants who are sick of the economy, uh, urban workers who are sick of the state, uh, sick of, of the privations of the war. And, and so this brings down the Tsar. And, and, and we know that story, it leads to the Tsar's abdication. And the rise of the provisional government, the Duma essentially asserting itself as the temporary uh, rulers of Russia. Then there's the period uh, of 1917, where there's the power struggle. This is what we experienced when we, we looked closely at Petrograd, the Petrograd Soviet, the provisional government, uh, which then culminates in the 1917 October Revolution, where the Bolsheviks, guided by Lenin and his very uh, ruthless, very clear seeing and tactically flexible methods, Lenin takes over onto the Bolsheviks uh, in October. Lenin uh, uh, promises a, a democratic uh, state. Uh, there are elections. The elections result not in a Bolshevik majority, but in a, a majority for the peasant parties. Lenin allows that, that representative body to meet one day, and then they're dissolved, and that's it. And for those of you, uh, for, for those who argue that Leninism inevitably leads to totalitarianism. This is one of your, your key pieces of evidence, that Lenin was not interested in tolerating dissent or anything like democracy. He was the revolutionary vanguard. He knew what he was going to do, and he didn't want anybody getting in his way. Um, you know, there's certainly evidence to support that argument. Uh, following the October Revolution and the Bolsheviks taking power, the Bolsheviks moved quickly to try and accomplish one of their main uh, campaign promises, if you will, peace. Uh, the idea that we must end this awful war that the soldiers, who you remember were the Bolshe some of the Bolsheviks' most important supporters, the soldiers demand peace, and so the Germans uh, and, and the Russians negotiate a peace treaty at Brest-Litovsk. The, the Brest-Litovsk treaty is really, really punitive to Russia. The Germans take pretty much everything they can get. Uh, they impose a war guilt clause. We've been through that story before. But the key thing is, for our story here, the, Rush, the Bolsheviks do end the war, uh, and although they give up a ton of Russian, air quotes, Russian territory, they do manage to end that particular problem, which is important because they are in the midst of a horrific civil war. Uh, for the, the Russian civil war that rises after the Bolshevik rise to power is horribly, horribly bloody. And that Russian civil war sort of is, the, in, in a sense, the first act in the, our, our story today. Um, it's, it's important to remember that the Russian civil war is is not just a struggle between Russians, although it is primarily that. Um, what, what you have to remember for the, about the Civil War is that the Bolsheviks control the center of the country. Now, no, they haven't been renamed as the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. So they control Moscow, they control Petrograd, they control the surrounding areas. The, the forces in opposition to them are sort of coming in from every direction. The, the, the Bolsheviks are surrounded. And, and the, the white forces, the, the forces in opposition to the Bolsheviks come to be known as the whites, just as the Bolsheviks come to be known as the reds. So the white forces are coming in from every direction. Notice also in this green area on the map that the allied forces, by which it means the forces of France and Great Britain and the United States, get involved in f helping the white forces in opposing the Reds, in trying to bring down this infant socialist Soviet state. It's something that, you know, in, in American history classes, people don't talk about a lot. They talk about it a lot in Soviet and Russian history classes, about how 
the Allies tried to strangle the, the, the weak Soviet state, uh, kick them when they're down, so to speak. Um, the war is horrific. The war lasts for about three years. Uh, it, it, but ultimately, the, the Bolsheviks, the Reds, win. They win because Trotsky puts together a, uh, builds a, a brilliant Red Army, which he manages very effectively and wins critical fights. Uh, they also win because they are blessed with inept enemies. The white forces never really get their act together. They don't have a common policy. You have all sorts of different ideologies amongst the white forces. You've got uh, old school, unreformed czarists who want to bring back an absolute monarchy. You've got liberals um, who are, are trying to make Russia an air quotes Western state. You've got people who just hate the Bolsheviks or hate Lenin. Or, um, and you've got these foreigners, you've got these Western allies who have their own fish to fry and their own personal interests that involve them getting involved in Russia's affairs. And those forces can never really agree on a strategy, on an ideology, on a policy. It allows Trotsky and the Russians, the, the, the Soviets, to, to um, deal with them in sequence rather than all, all at once. And although the suffering is awful, the Bolsheviks win. They consolidate power and they are able to uh, put themselves in a position where they can really hang on, somewhat miraculously, to Russia. Now, the consequences of this for Russia are dire. The suffering uh, from, from the Civil War is immense. Um, the economy already in horrific shape as a result of the First World War only gets worse during the Civil War. Uh, and there's large-scale starvation. Millions of people die directly or indirectly as a result of this civil war. The national income during this period, uh, you know, by, by 1920, when the war is basically over, when the, when the Bolsheviks have won, the national income is less than a third of what it was before the First World War. Now, remember, Russia was not... You know, was not nearly as uh, as affluent as the Western states, but now it's down to poverty levels as an average. Um, uh, industrial production has been completely trashed. It's down to less than twenty percent of what it was before the war. To, to give you a few specifics, coal production is ten percent of what it was. Before the war, iron production is down to one fortieth of what it was, and 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 uh, when you, when you look at the the how this affects people, we're not just talking about the industrial stuff, but how are people actually living? The answer is not well. They're living very very poorly. The ration for workers in cities like Moscow and Petrograd are tiny, 60 grams of bread and a few potatoes a day. That's barely anything to live on. Uh, so, so you have tremendous suffering, hardship, and death, which is important in and of itself. But it's also important because of, its, of the situation that it creates for the government, the situation that it leads to for the Bolsheviks. The problem, besides all the obvious human suffering and loss, the problem that the Bolsheviks face now, having finally defeated their adversaries, having finally beaten back the enemy, the problem the Bolsheviks have now is how do we build a state, how do we build a functioning economy, how do we assert our authority in the face of all of this loss? And there's sort of three parts to their problem. First problem is they, there's a real shortage of skilled personnel. Uh, Russia, of course, was uh, underdeveloped, under-educated uh, under, uh, before 
Um, and, and so now after, after all these years of suffering from 1914 to 1920, you know, there just aren't many people left who know how to do complicated things, who know how to maintain a, a steel plant or build a, a, a power facility um, or organize complicated financial transactions. It, it, there just aren't enough people who have those technical skills. Um, to sort of add to that, the, the, the broad population is really ignorant. 70% of the Russian population is illiterate. You know, the most basic levels of, of, of ignorance. Um, and so you don't have people, there, there aren't the people with the knowledge and the skills that you need to rebuild an industrial economy. Um, and then to, to, to add to that, to, to make it sort of the Bolsheviks' particular problem, is that the people that the Bolsheviks had leaned on to make the revolution happen, have been shattered. The, the working class, that organized, revolutionary, politically conscious working class that had supported the Bolsheviks uh, in the October Revolution, uh, the well, November, October, November revolutions, they're, they're shattered. Lots of them have died on the battlefields, or they fled to the countryside because there's enough food. The, the, uh, as a consequence of this, by 1920, the population of Moscow is half of what it was. The population of St. Petersburg is down by a third. And so th th there's a simple absence of people, trained, skilled, even basically educated, committed people that the Bolsheviks can turn to and make use of to rebuild their shattered country. So that's, that's, you know, the Bolsheviks have finally won. Congratulations, you've won. What you've won is a country which is a complete disaster. And by the way, you've got very, very few people to help rebuild it. What are you going to do, Vladimir? Well, this is the set that's the scene for the new economic policy, which you should have gotten from McKay, um, the NEP. Um, the, the, the new economic policy is Lenin's attempt to uh, find a way to bring Russia back. And this is, you can think of this as Lenin's great strength or his great weakness. Lenin is always tactically flexible. I mean, he always has his eyes on the ultimate prize of a, of a, a socialist state, a Marxist state, but he's also willing to make all kinds of compromises um, to, to what it would seem to, to go against Marxist ideology in order to achieve short or medium term goals. The new economic policy, um, and this is, a, this is a poster from that period, it, it, uh, it's Lenin pointing towards the future and the, the Cyrillic says, from NEP Russia will emerge socialist Russia. Um, so, so what he's basically saying is we're going to have this new economic policy and that will lead us transitionally to socialism, real socialism. Because the new economic policy is really not socialism. The NEP is Lenin making some moderate but important concessions to capitalist market economy. Um, he, he essentially allows the peasants to keep their land. You remember that was a huge issue in 1917. The peasants had taken control of their land. They asserted that they owned it. They were quite literally willing to die for the ownership of their land. The Bolsheviks had said, you're going to, even though it's not really against our principles, they had suggested the peasants are going to keep it. And Lenin says, yes, the peasants get to keep their land. The peasants get to uh, grow their own prop, their own crops. They get to make their own decisions about production. They get to make their own decisions about how to sell it. And this allows and encourages uh, a, a sort of group of, of small traders, people who will buy the goods from the countryside and then resell them. They will in turn sell goods to the peasants. Um, and all of this, you know, as, as, as Westerners, we look at it and say, oh, well, 
Of course, exactly. That's what the market economy does. Adam Smith would be all over that. If you're a Marxist revolutionary, that's not really what you're going for. But Lenin, again, tactically flexible, recognizing the problem that he has, he's willing to let it happen. There are people who criticize him within the Bolshevik party that this isn't right, that this isn't pure, but Lenin pulls it off. And it is, in some sense, a positive thing. It really does begin an economic revival. And quite impressively, um, you know, you always have to remember just how big Russia is and how potentially strong Russia is. And whenever Russia can get its act together and really harness its resources, Russia is a behemoth. And Lenin begins to tap into that very quickly. Um, and by giving all these people this, this freedom and getting them motivated, um, they really do begin to produce wealth. And again, as, as Western descendants of Adam Smith, we look at that and say, yes, of course, that's exactly what you'd expect. On the other hand, uh, there is a price to be paid for this. The price is that by strengthening literally millions of these small peasant proprietors and the traders who come with them, Lenin is basically building millions of proto-capitalists, millions of people who have an interest in a market economy, not in his great socialist vision. This is going to be a real problem uh, that, that is going to have to be dealt with by the, by the Bolsheviks down the line. Um, it's, going to be, it's going to be ultimately solved by Stalin, I say solved in air quotes, um, through a policy of forced collectivization, which is going to be disastrous. But... Um, for the moment, Lenin, again, always tactically flexible, um, is willing to, to pay that price or to kick that can down the road in order to, to begin to rebuild the economy. This new economic policy does not work as well with Russia's industries. Um, uh, you, you can't uh, just uh, as easily rebuild steel mills uh, or railroads, or power generation facilities um, in the same way you can encourage peasant farming. Um, it, there's all sorts of experiments and, and, and attempts, um, and there's some progress that's being made, but it isn't enough. And what that means is the working class, the, the industrial proletariat, does not recover as quickly as the peasantry, as the peasants do. There aren't nearly as many industrial jobs being rebuilt. You don't have that cadre of industrial workers that were central to, to Marx's ideology, to Lenin's ideology, and to the support of the Bolsheviks. That's going to matter. Okay, so you've got this peasantry, which is rebuilding and doing some good stuff, but is not really revolutionary. You have a working class, which is recovering very slowly and doesn't have anything like the discipline or power that it might have had. Um, you've got a, 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 a Bolshevik party that's, that's you know, been through the wars, literally. And this is where we see the rise of the bureaucracy. And this is really going to be the heart of the argument for how we get from from revolutionary Bolshevism to Soviet totalitarianism. It's the rise of the bureaucracy and the union of the bureaucracy with the party that's going to cause this, uh, this ultimate disaster. All right, so, so what's the prelude? How do we get that? The, the Russia needs expertise. It needs people who know how to build a modern state who know how to run a modern economy. Um, they need skilled workers, skilled thinkers, skilled leaders. And so, so, so many of them, of the Russians who would be those people, are now dead. If there had been the revolutions in advanced Western industrial countries, like the Bolsheviks really, really hoped there would be in Germany after the First World War, um, that would have built a... Um, a revolutionary international coalition and the Bolsheviks could have gained access to the knowledge and the skills of Western Europe um, uh, and, and that would have allowed 
them to rebuild Russia's shattered industry. German communists or Swedish communists or French communists would have come in and helped the young Soviet Union rebuild itself in a great revolutionary coalition. That was the dream, but it didn't happen. Uh, uh, it, it doesn't happen um, uh, because those Western revolutions don't happen. They, they either never get off the ground at all, or like in Germany, they happen, but they're quickly snuffed out. And so the Soviet Union isn't getting any help from outside its own borders. There's no one coming to assist them with rebuilding their state. Um, what this means is the Bolsheviks have to look somewhere else to, to find experts who can help them. You, know, you, just, you have to have somebody who knows how to do these things. How do you get the taxes collected? How do you get the power generated? How do you get food moved from point A where it's grown to point B where people are hungry? That, that's not casual. You need expertise to do that. And the Bolsheviks have to find those experts and those people who are expert don't have any sympathy, the, the, the Russian experts, the people who would have been doing this job under the czar or the provisional government, they have no sympathy with the revolution. You know, they, they, many of them had sided with the white armies during the Civil War, but they're still there. So, so how do you get those people to work for you? How does, you, I mean, our, our, our images of totalitarian Soviet Union notwithstanding, you can't force people, you can't bludgeon and threaten people into doing these kind of jobs effectively. Um, and in 1921, 22, Lenin probably doesn't have the clout to just start ordering mass executions, even if he wanted to, even if they were going to work. It, it, so, so you can't just bully the people into doing this. You have to make them want to do it. And so the Bolsheviks have to offer these officials privilege. They have to give them a reason to want to do it. So, so these uh, old czarist officials, capitalist managers, middle class professionals, they're, they're offered things. They're offered higher salaries, uh, special act, privileged access to consumer goods. We make it worth their while. It's the carrot. Um, this leads now to this layer, this privileged layer of experts who evolve then into the bureaucracy. They become this large body holding power, holding privileges because they hold these administrative offices. That's a bureaucracy. And the central administration, the, the people in Moscow who are running the government. There's probably 200,000 of these people now in Moscow, these professional managers, these professional bureaucrats, who, again, these are not communists. These are not Bolsheviks. These are people who are doing jobs for which they are being well compensated. And the Bolsheviks need them. This now creates this, this, uh, this, infection, if you will, of bureaucratism into the Communist Party. These privileged people um, are, are, you know, they're self-seeking. They're, they're seeking to advance their, their careers. They're not looking to advance the cause of Marx. They're not looking to advance the revolution. They're looking to advance their own personal interests. Um, and um, the, 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 those people become more and more powerful. There are some Bolsheviks who, um, working within the state administration, adapt to these bureaucratic methods. They adapt to this administration. They themselves become bureaucrats and become concerned with acquiring material privilege, securing jobs within the administrative apparatus. They're not revolutionaries anymore, they're bureaucrats, they're administrators, they're guys doing jobs. And the champion of these people, the guy who really recognizes them and looks out for them is Stalin. Um, the, so, so we have these bureaucratic methods and outlook which uh, um, becomes mirrored in the Communist Party. Now, notice we have two different things here. We have the government, we have the state, we have the people in charge of making the, the economy work. And then 
On the other side, we have the Communist Party. They're not the same thing at the start. The Communist Party, Lenin's group, Communist Party of the Soviet Union, they're in charge, they're the ones who made the revolution happen, and they are supposedly the ones with the power, the ones running the, the country, making the big decisions. But we have this, this bureaucratic group, these administrators, and what we begin to see is an overlap of the bureaucratic state with the Communist Party. More and more leading party officials come to hold positions in the government. And this is Stalin's big realization. Stalin becomes the general secretary of the Communist Party in 1922, and he is the central spokesperson for the, this bureaucratic group of people. He accelerates its, its advancement, its crystallization, by using his authority as the party's general secretary to promote those loyal to the apparatus that he heads into, into important jobs. So Stalin says, hmm, you are uh, an ambitious young communist. If you agree to follow me, I'll get you this good job in the government. By the same token, you are uh, a talented young uh, ambitious administrator, a local sub-governor or something like that, uh, I can see that you're promoted, but you join the Communist Party and you agree to follow my orders. So Stalin is, is controlling and benefiting from this overlap between the state bureaucracy and the Communist Party. This is where we get into contingency. This, some, something like this probably was going to happen no matter what. But the people at the time don't recognize what's happening, or not enough people see. This increasing fusion of the party apparatus with the state apparatus, um, uh, uh, this coincides with the disappearance of worker Bolsheviks. Um, the, 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 the traditional proletariat worker, you know, the guy with calluses on his hand, the guy who was on the barricades in 1917, the guy who's really connected to the grassroots, who knows what it's like to work for a living, that guy, less and less important. Not really a, a, a player anymore um, as, as we get more and more of these managers uh, in, in positions of power. Now, you might very well, and I, I, I hope you are, say to yourself, well, wait a minute. Can that guy, that worker guy with the calluses on his hands and the overalls and all like that, could he ever really have substantial political power? I mean, is it possible to have a bureaucratized workers state? Can the workers ever have power once you require managers, once you require complex skills? Is it reasonable to expect a proletariat worker to be able to manage uh, an investment bank um, or to uh, be in charge of power generation in an entire province? It's a fair question. Um, regardless of the answer, we can, we can agree that those guys are being uh, squeezed out. Um, and so this is sort of the, the, a subjective, contingent failure of the Bolshevik party. Only a small number of the Bolsheviks, the, the air quotes, real revolutionaries, um, recognized this danger in the beginning of the 20s, when it was still possible to combat it. And, and very few people recognize what Stalin is doing. He's subtle, he's clever, he's getting things done, it's not like you can just open up the newspaper and say, oh, well, this will inevitably lead to Stalin as a totalitarian dictator. Maybe we should do something about it. Very few people see that that's just coming. And because of that, they don't take the steps that were possible at the time to combat this, this growing bureaucratization and Stalin's control of it. Now, one guy who does begin to understand the problem is the most important guy, 
Lenin. Lenin realizes that uh, in, in the, about 1921-22, that this bureaucratization of the state and of the party is a problem. And, um, uh, and, and he recognizes that it's a threat to his vision of a socialist workers' state. And so at the 10th Party Congress, this is the great annual meeting that the, uh, uh, the, the communists would have, uh, 1921, Lenin signals that he's going to try and fight this. And he characterizes Russia as a worker's state with bureaucratic deformations. In other words, we've got the worker's state, but we don't have it the way we want it yet. And he says some very interesting things. I'm going to read a little bit from what Lenin said. What he says at, at this point in 1921, the main economic power is in our hands. All the vital large enterprises, the railways, etc., are in our hands. The economic power in the hands of the proletarian state of Russia is quite adequate to ensure the transition to communism. What, then, is lacking? Obviously, what is lacking is culture among the stratum of communists who perform administrative functions. If we take Moscow, with its 4,700 communists in responsible positions, and if we take that huge bureaucratic machine, that gigantic heap, we must ask who is directing whom. I doubt very much whether it can truthfully be said that the communists are directing the heap. To tell the truth, they are not directing, they are being directed. Very often, the bourgeois officials know the business better than our best communists, who are invested with authority and have every opportunity but who cannot make the slightest use of their rights and authority. So that's Lenin laying it out. That's Lenin saying, look, we won. We have all the power. We've got the control, but we're not getting what we want. And we're not getting it because the managers we have aren't good enough. The managers, these bourgeois machines, that we need to run the state is too powerful, is too, uh, is, is, is too entrenched for us to casually push it aside. And the communists, the good communists who are there, um, even though they are supposedly have authority, they're basically getting pushed around or co-opted by the bureaucrats. So what's to be done? What, how, if you're, what does Lenin think is the solution to this problem? He goes on. And again, again, this is his 1921 speech. The key feature is that we have not got the right men in the right places. That responsible communists who acquitted themselves magnificently during the revolution have been given commercial and industrial functions about which they know nothing. And they prevent us from seeing the truth. For rogues and rascals hide magnificently behind their backs. Choose the proper men and introduce practical control. That is what the people will appreciate. So basically he's saying, all you guys, you Bolsheviks, you good revolutionaries who are out there fighting in 1917 or 18, 19, 20, great, good job. You're useless for this. Yes, you're heroes but you're not capable of doing this kind of job. You don't have those skills. And we need to get better, smarter, more educated people who are communists who, are can, who can overcome this bureaucratic power. So that's the idea. That's, that's, the, that's setting up the fight. Could Lenin have done this? Is it possible? Is it, is it even conceivable that you could have somehow overcome and broken the power of this bourgeois bureaucracy uh, in order to 
create a truly socialist state, or at least a, a Russian state that was more socialist, less uh, inhumane. Is it possible? We don't know. Because before Lenin can really try this, he has a stroke. Um, in uh, December, uh, well, in, in 1922, Lenin has surgery. Uh, he, there was an assassination attempt against him in 1918. Uh, a bullet had lodged in him. He'd been carrying that bullet around with him for years. It was causing problems. They tried to have a, a surgeon remove it, and a consequence of the surgery, Lenin has a stroke and then a, a series of others. So crippled by these strokes in December of 1922, Lenin tries to move against the person he has figured out is really behind this rise of bureaucratic power, and that person is Stalin. And so he writes this, uh, um, this, uh, this, this famous letter. He's prompted partly because he begins to understand who Stalin is. Um, he, Stalin, um, although, and we'll, we'll do Stalin some other time, but Stalin is, um, uh, a, a, although he's a, he's a Georgian, in other words, he's not an ethnic Russian, uh, he's in favor of a Russian-controlled Soviet Union. Um, and, and this disturbs Lenin. Lenin's v vision of the Soviet Union was as a real union, uh, a, a collection of um, uh Soviet republics, Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, um, and all of them would be equals in the Union. All of them would have the right to secede, but they wouldn't secede because they would want to be part of the Soviet Union. Stalin is not a part of that. Stalin wants to force everybody into a Russian model. This frightens Lenin. This is not what Lenin wants. Um, he also uh, uh, sees that Stalin is, is creating this, this bureaucratic power structure. And so, um, although he is gravely ill, um, he, he um, dictates, he can't write anymore, but he dictates a note accusing Stalin and his supporters of adopting the outlook of the Russian bureaucracy. He accuses Stalin of being a chauvinist for great Russia. Um, and... and um, he, and, and, and then he, he famously concludes this letter with this warning. Um, Comrade Stalin, having become Secretary General, has unlimited authority concentrated in his hands. And I am not sure whether he will always be capable of using that authority with sufficient caution. Uh, he then makes an addition, uh, an, 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 an appendix to this on January 4th, a few days later, and he calls for Stalin's replacement as the general secretary. Um, and he prepares to begin to fight against Stalin's bureaucratic faction at the 12th Party Congress. Um, but he knows he's sick. He knows he may have strokes, further strokes. He may not make it to the Congress. Um, and so he goes to Trotsky and he says, we need to form a block against the bureaucracy in general, against Stalin in particular. He turns over his notes to Trotsky to use against Stalin at the Congress. And so that set the stage for the great turning point of 1923. This is when the Russian Revolution really could have gone in two directions. And um, tragically, it goes with Stalin. Um, so, so the the... The short story is that Lenin dies. I think there's actually some pretty good evidence that Stalin uh, has Lenin murdered, uh, poisoned. Um, that's not dispositive. Not, not all scholars agree on that. But um, I put it this way. We know Stalin had control of led access to Lenin, so he had the opportunity to do it. Uh, we know that he certainly could have uh, organized uh, uh, Lenin's assassination. And uh, we certainly know Stalin had no reluctance to order people killed. So there's sort of a means-method motive uh, here uh, that 
it would I don't think anyone should be surprised if Stalin uh, kills Lenin. Um, but but regardless, um, Lenin dies, and Trotsky does not bring down Lenin. Um, Trotsky fails. Uh, we'll, we'll go into the, the details in, in, in a moment. Um, but but Lenin uh, Lenin's death and Trotsky's failure lead to Stalin's success. So so this is really sort of where we get to the question of the inevitability. Um, to use Lenin's phrase, the bureaucratic deformations of the state are inevitable. You can't run a modern state without expertise. Uh, a modern state requires bureaucrats who are trained, who are expert, who can make the trains run on time. You have to have those guys. Um, so that you know, the idea that you can have some sort of Marxist socialist utopia where everybody just works with their hands and things sort of magically happen because of goodwill, that's not that's silly. That's not going to happen. So that some kind of deformation is inevitable. But, the argument goes, the, a, the bureaucracy's accumulation of political power is not inevitable. That the, that the bureaucracy could have been subordinate to other entities. Um, for example, think of the United States. We have a vast government bureaucracy but that bureaucracy is essentially subordinate to the other branches of government, elected branches of government, the Congress, the president, to a certain extent, the judiciary. Um, the American bureaucracy is, uh, and the large American government is, is obviously important and powerful, but it's not the same thing as our, it doesn't have the political power in the United States. So I don't think it's inevitable that state bureaucracy leads to political control. In the Soviet Union, it did, but that depended upon the outcome of a political struggle, which was contingent. So, 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 that, so that's sort of the political crux of the matter. Can revolutionaries, in quotes, or if you prefer, representatives of the people maintain power or must the bureaucracy triumph and, and acquire a, a political power? Um, that is, I think, an open question. Um, it, 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 as, I, as, I, as I say in my American example, I don't think it's inevitable that bureaucratic state authority leads necessarily to political power. But perhaps we should look at the events. Trotsky is, the, is sort of the great crossroads here. Um, Trotsky, as Lenin is fading and has giving Trotsky his, his, his notes, his ammunition, and basically saying, go get Stalin. And Trotsky doesn't. Um, he said later in his life that if he had come forward at the 12th Congress uh, in 1923, uh, that he could have brought down Stalin, um, but he didn't. He, he confronts Stalin privately. He basically says, look, this is what Lenin has said. This is what Lenin has written. He thinks that you're out of line. Um, and I will... I will take you down. I will oppose you unless you agree to some changes. Um, uh, and he wants a you know, radical change of policy in the national question. In other words, let the, let the, the different Soviet states have more union. Uh, and, you know, he, he wants to cut down on persecution. Uh, he, wants, he wants basically to uh, uh, try and cut back on the bureaucracy uh, and... and, and uh, and bring more revolutionary values back into the party. And Stalin says, oh, of course, these are su wonderful suggestions. He agrees um, and, um, and, and, and quickly uh, uh, yields to Trotsky's private request. Trotsky then honors his part of the compromise. He does not publish Lenin's notes, 
on this on the Georgian controversy. He does not attack Stalin or his associates at the Congress. Um, he lets the moment slip. Stalin does not honor the compromise. Stalin basically takes Trotsky's hesitation as weakness. He buys time and uh, he begins a campaign against Trotsky. Uh, he, he, he begins to spread rumors about Trotsky. The Trotsky once is aspiring to be the Napoleon of the Russian Revolution. Remember, Trotsky was a great military hero. Um, after, as soon as the Congress is over, Stalin and his associates tighten their hold on the state and the party operas, and they begin to move to isolate Trotsky. Um, all of those promises that Stalin made to Trotsky about economic and organizational reform, they don't happen. Um, and, and when Trotsky realizes that Stalin is, is not keeping his promises, he's lost his edge. He's, the, the, Stalin has gained power, has shifted more and more to the bureaucracy. Trotsky has lost power. Um, at the same time, there's a, a great German uh, a, a socialist revolution in Germany in 1923. It's crushed. This creates a uh, real loss of morale amongst the hardcore revolutionaries uh, around Trotsky. Um, Trotsky then tries to use the material Lenin had left him. He tries to publish this material that says, you know, Lenin himself, the great, the great leader, had criticized Stalin and called for Stalin's removal, but he can't do anything with it because he can't get it published. Stalin now controls the, the mechanisms of censorship. Um, and, and so Trotsky can't get this out into general circulation. Um, Stalin is able to lock him down. Um, and, and this really is the, is, is the, is the end for Trotsky. Um, uh, he hangs on for a few years. He becomes more and more outspoken in his criticism of Stalin, but he's less and less able to accomplish anything. Um, in, uh, in 1927, He's actually expelled from the Communist Party for deviating from the Stalinist line. In 1928, he's exiled to Siberia. In 1929, he's deported to Turkey, in to Turkey and then he flees to Mexico. Um, he never shuts up. Um, and he continues to criticize Stalin from afar. He writes constantly uh, from a, a position of being overseas where Stalin can't um, uh, uh, censor him. Um, Stalin is an unforgiving son of a gun, and in 1940 he sends assassins uh, who uh, uh, sneak into Trotsky's, uh, well, they get entrance into Trotsky's uh, home in Mexico under false pretenses and then uh, bludgeon him, stab him to death. Um, and so, so, so Stalin has triumphed. And so, um, uh, but before we, we, we run out the Trotsky thing, we, 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 we need to deal with Lenin's death. Um, Lenin's death really sort of opens the way for Stalin's great triumph. Um, uh, early 1924, following Lenin's death, uh, Stalin throws open the membership of the Communist Party to, to bring in large numbers of workers, right? The Communist Party is too small, it's too elite, we need more workers, more real people of the grassroots in the party. And this was called to the, sort of referred to as the Lenin levy, right? We're going to be in honor of Lenin's death. We're going to expand the party to bring in more real people. Well, of course, that's just the spin. The truth is that um, Stalin is not bringing in workers. What he's bringing in are the bureaucrats. He's bringing in a huge number of uh, um, uh, bureaucrats into the party who further isolate and defeat the hardcore revolutionaries, the old Bolsheviks. And by 1927, a, a, an absolute majority of the people who are members of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union are also government officials. We have essentially made the Communist Party and the government the same thing, with Stalin in charge of both. Having accomplished this, Stalin now moves to eliminate, to, to, to liquidate uh, his enemies, the, the air quotes, real Bolsheviks. Um, so these are the, you know, these old Bolsheviks who, who had led the revolution um, are, are now politically defeated by 1929 uh, and they're all going to be exterminated uh, 
uh, at some point or other during the during the 1930s. And you can see from this chart just how many of these guys die from unnatural causes. You've got a few, those guys in sort of in the middle in green, they're the ones who die of what you might call natural causes. You got a few guys in purple over on the right, they're the ones who basically died during the civil wars, during the revolution. But all those guys in red, they're all gonna be executed. Um, and this, and, and notice what this is, this is the, the central party of the Communist Party in 1917. So these are the Bolshevik party in the beginning of 1917. Um, these are the guys who did it. And by the time of the 1930s, they're almost all gone. Stalin has, has, has eliminated them. Um, um, so, so what Stalin has now accomplished is he's remade the Communist Party and the Soviet government in in his own image, right? It's rigid, it's hierarchical, it's secretive, it's tyrannical. He, he defeats the, the regeneration of revolutionary leaders who had made the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 and he exterminates them. Um, and so it's not just the central leaders though, it's not just these guys, it's almost the entire membership of the party of 1917, who had actually participated in the revolution, they're all going to be killed during the Great Terror of the 1930s, right? So, so the people who actually made the revolution happen are all gone by the time of the real heights of Stalinist terror. And so this is is sort of the um, this is this is the the main argument for the people who would say that Stalinism was not inevitable, right? That, that if, if, if you're going to argue that, um, that Stalinism is the logical extension of Bolshevism, you should probably be able to show that the people who were part of the Bolshevik Revolution created the Stalinist extremes, but they don't. Stalin wins a power struggle. And having won that, he eliminates all of those old guys. And maybe this persuades you that it could have been different and that Bolshevism is not the same thing as Stalinism. So, so, so this is, um, and, and so now this is the transition from, from, the, from the revolutionary party of 1917, the party of Lenin, the pardon of the ideals of the revolution, to an instrument of dictatorship, to, uh, to Stalin and the horrors of the Soviet Union, and, and this administrative machine dominated by the heads of the bureaucratic operators of the state, um, uh, they, they control the, all, all of the economy, they control the trade unions, they control the party itself. And it was a communist party in name only. It was in fact the tyrannical government of the Soviet dictatorship. Thank you very much.